So this is Kashmiri pulao or? Pulao means it's a rai rice. Prosta rice. Red and plain rice. Uh -huh. So you call it rice? This is rice. Uh -huh. Pulao meat. And this is kofte? It is like kofte. And this one? Rogan Josh. Oh. And those are? It is cauliflower, some vegetable. Mm. And this is Kamalpinsko. Collard green. Oh. Dear Professor. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for receiving me. And uh, you know that uh, what you mean for my professional life. Oh, it has been that... always a pleasure to be associated with you. you know, no, but you know, I will be always uh, so grateful to you for that very first conference in my life. Where, when you received me. And put me together with the great specialists in uh, uh, first Sovietologists, then the specialists in Central Asia, and it was a great school of life for me. Oh, and that was my job, and that was my. It gave me personally uh, very happy to involve and engage with uh, area specialists and particularly those from the region, neighboring region of Central Asia and elsewhere to connect together and interact. And it has, I think, it has proved itself uh, that you are still in regular touch with our university, JNU, and other universities, and also our former colleagues and new colleagues. Now, the, it is a that is, is maybe it? that was my in behind the back that was my idea but that is it <laughs> yes you believed in me and you gave me wings to fly actually Thank you. i take it this way but professor as time passes uh our young students they're also interested to know oh, yes. who is professor kulbushan variko Okay. As I was telling to them, because I share my uh, experience in uh, regional studies, in area studies, I was telling them at my very first conference, when I was going to India, I didn't know what is expecting me there, but I, I thought that this K Wariko probably was a Japanese person. <laughs> But no, it is not so. Then uh, we came to know that this uh, person is one of those because in India there were not many uh, professionals who were interested in Central Asia. And although the, the center was called Inner Asia, uh, you were dealing with Central Asia. You, you produced uh, so many scholars, 34, 35. PhD yeah. and 50. Three M field, pre doctoral. <laughs> Could you tell us more about your experience, like your professional experience, of course? Yeah, before coming to JNU, I was based in Kashmir, Srinagar, Kashmir, mm -hmm. and I worked in a government department of Jammu and Kashmir government, which was a sort of archives, a reference resource section. I worked there 14 years and 9 months and actually the credit goes to my placement there because all documents pertaining to Jammu, Kashmir, Ladakh, Gilgit, Hunza, Frontiers, Afghanistan, these came to my notice and I was scanning through them, not fully reading them but grasping bit by bit and over a period of this over this period, I found that I need to work on now Kashmir and Central Asia because it was just being talked about but no fundamental research was done. So my first PhD work was Central Asia and Kashmir it was in, in modern times basically in the context of Great Game, Anglo-Russian Revolution. It was my PhD in Jawaharlal University and it was later published in 1988. So later when I joined JNU School of International Studies and 
started this ventilation studies program it was already there but it was in infancy not so vibrant so central asia program was not uh, in russian studies they did it after us ah but first it was uh, our program was already there central asia it was looked after by professor ram rao who retired long back okay. and after his retirement i joined as associate professor and but professor ram rao's idea of this was he was focusing more on nepal bhutan and this region himalayan trans himalayan region this central himalayan region but when i did i because of my own personal deep interest in central asia i uh, refocused the activities of this area and research teams of the students on central asia mainly and or a period i spent around 87 and i i retired in 2016 but three years more i was there to teach so 87 to 2019 i 33 PhD scholars and 52 MPhil scholars. It's a big number. And big number, and but each student has a different theme. If you watch Puneet, you know. So his theme is based on his academic background discipline. That is, he had a sociology as a major. So yeah, I gave him the theme ethnics and clans in Kazakhstan. And ethnic, social stratification. Social stratification in. same so one was geographical background so he got arals some got other like that economic background so economic anurag 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 did on china and kazakhstan so like that uh, nobody's theme is duplicating with anybody else whether in ampul or pd and that is why all of them are well placed I am very happy that all my PhD scholars and new MPhil scholars are well placed, and they are doing very well in their jobs, in their respective places. So that is a satisfaction. And then I started this journal, Himalayan and Central Asian Studies. This has completed twenty eight seven years and twenty eighth year also. And still, it is publishing. Ah, uh, still publishing. It's a hard work. It means a lot of work, but people across Central Asia and elsewhere, they are very enthusiastic about their participation in this journal and their publication of their papers. Your journal is very famous. So, recently, Uzbekistan special issue was published, and it was released at the 80th anniversary of Uzbekistan Academy of Sciences in Tashkent. It was very well. Very well received and welcome. Together with Mirza Hit. Mirza, because uh, we had the cooperation of Professor Mirza Hidrahimu, who was the guest editor for this uh, special issue, and uh, this is how it keeps me going. I, in spite of my after my retirement, uh, so many years back, I still <laughs> try to cope up with because this means a lot of work. And my recent book, this is my twenty-third book. But this is this book took me around thirty-five years. Well, collection. It is a very difficult subject. The crossroads is the main, but it is about Kashmir Sinjang linkages in terms of trade, cultural context, historical context, and then the Great Game impact, the British policies in Kashmir as a result of this Great Game. Then Chinese policies towards Gilgit, Hussar, Ladakh, and stuff. Then how Gilgit was taken from India in 1947, Operation Datak Hill, as a consequence of, as a response to, or as a reaction to the Soviet inroads into Xinjiang. So and just Gilgit was taken. Gilgit took, Pakistan took it ultimately, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it was a British mm-hmm. operation. Mm-hmm. It is was called named the Takhil. It is there. I have put a special chapter on that, 
operation mm. dot akil in india so gilgit was initially designed to be part of india it was part of gnk it is part of jammu and kashmir mm-hmm. gilgit is part of jammu and kashmir like ladar gilgit was also there there was our in waziri wazar that is governor from chogorna how he was taken under arrest major brown he was the bridge uh, you know what we call major brown was the gilgit scouts ka he was their head actually it was a bridge boy but it took them a lot of times they had done a lot of you know, what should i say preparation gilgit was already in their eyes since na 1870s 1880s but finally when they saw that so it is inching into india uh, during the communist china period because the warlords were ruling india and those warlords were acting independently of beijing and they were hobnobbing with the soviets so it british thought that the soviet union will enter india and then threaten british indian territory mm-hmm. that was one reason and plus they wanted to outflank soviet union from the mm-hmm. new ways in gilgit so this was the reason and india lost in this process mm-hmm. and earlier also british were acting very you know they were very much pro china during both 19th century and early 20th century because they wanted to have access to xinjiang in order to collect information and know about activities of russians and soviets in central asia so they wanted to enter xinjiang so they could enter only when they were friendly with chinese authorities in xinjiang so they always sidelined the maharaja of kashmir's request and my kashmir demands on the territory of the border they didn't let it be delimited it could have been easily done at the time but they kept it hanging hanging just because they didn't want to damage their ongoing negotiations dialogue and engagement with chinese authorities in xinjiang and also in beijing So the net result was that Kashmir lost in terms of territory, in terms of both uh, Gilgit was later, but earlier also in Shahidullah region and other mm-hmm. regions. So the British were openly favoring China and inducing Chinese to come forward and occupy this territory. Why? Because they they were fearing that Russians would come. from pamit and they would occupy so they wanted chinese to come from this side occupy up to that point so this is how china gained and you also mentioned hunza hunza what is with hunza hunza is another uh, cheap ship hunza and nagar two two cheap ships of jammu and kashmir these were also near gilgit so these are also strategic because it is also neighboring xinjiang mm-hmm. hunza had its chief of hunza used to have special relationship with the governor of xinjiang government of xinjiang particularly the south xinjiang yarkan and kashmir mm-hmm. why because in 1760 mid after mid 18th century and early 19th century there were a lot of muslim khoja rebellions against chinese authorities in xinjiang so they also were successful several times these insurrections so chinese were very much worried about it the xinjiang authorities so they sent emissaries to hunza chief and also of ladakh requesting that if you find some because it was a route mm-hmm. ongoing route from between yarkand and ladakh it was the route so they requested that if any rebel muslim rebel comes to your territory 
please capture him and hand us his head for alive or dead. So what <laughs> Honza chief captured some Kyrgyz and killed them and sent the trophy of Kyrgyz heads to Xinjiang authorities. And people who are living in Hunza, who they are by their ethnicity mostly? Darts. 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 Hmm. Sheena Dart. Gilgit also Dart. Hmm. But now Pakistan has inducted uh, so many Punjabis and maybe Afghans also in order to so they are mixed. change the population. What is happening with Balochistan there in Pakistan? Yeah, because Balochi Bilo- 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 tribal leaders is another same, story. Same thing is here. But it doesn't come open because it has been always this region under the Iron Curtain. So nobody knows about it. Uh, so because there is restriction to go. Movement, movement, restricted movement mm-hmm. to go there inside. So that is how this book is very... For the first time I have culled these documents, it took me a long time. National Archives of India, Jammu and Kashmir Archives and India Office Records over a long period, three mm-hmm. decades. And finally I finished it three years back and for some gave it to publisher. He took one and a half years plus. But it is a good publisher, Rupa, it is kept, uh, it is kept no price. Affordable mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that many people can can afford it. Afford now. Yeah, yeah. Because like we basically know very little about Kashmir. And professor, what is your idea about Azad Kashmir? Because from time to time, I have my book. I had organized a conference in 2009 on. Azad, about the uh, Azad, the POK, including Gilgit and Baltistan. Mm-hmm. And it was for the first time that a big delegation of those Kashmiris and activists and scholars from Pakistan itself, mm-hmm. Mirbam, Professor Mirbam was Bhatti from Mirpur. He was, he was principal of college here, he came. Mm-hmm. Then Manzoor Parwana came. Mm-hmm. From Gilgit, another man came from Hunza, another came from, I think four or five people came from Pakistan. Oh. And uh, POK people from London, Shabir Chaudhary came. Dr. Shabir Chaudhary is a Abrala court. Shaukat Kashmiri and Nasir Raza, they are also from that region. They live in Burn, so they also came. So this resulted in a very beautiful collection and a very beautiful book, The Other Kashmir. So it is, it was published by IGSA. Mm-hmm. So you can, you, you can refer these books to your students. The Other Kashmir is available. It can be downloaded free, but this is available on Amazon. And this journal is available on my website, www.maliamc.org. You can download it free. Okay. So, there is a lot of work, and they have, Shabir wrote about the hydropower exploitation in this region, Neil of Bailey and, mm-hmm. and Mangala Dam and other, and they are raising the height of this Mangala Dam without any compensation. And the height is that they have built this Basha Dam. Hunza <laughs> China links and the hmm. get operation that I killed. They, they <laughs> were openly doing it. How I got hold of those telegrams and the diaries of British officers involved into it. So that is how hmm, so I made it. came to know it. About it. Did you have any, like, uh, how do you call it, uh, reviews by Pakistanis? Or like after I it don't was know about this. I don't know, but earlier books, I think they were being read there and they were, there was some the modern frontiers of India was reviewed by their Islamabad, you know, IPJ, policy research or something. I saw on the net, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'm 
problem is what i notice is this in this age of social media and internet your scholars young particular they rely on the internet sources they just see cookie cookie what we call cookie cookie just keep and paste content paste and the nobody very few are going into original research problem with our students is also that they are not trained to read uh, you have to read and you have you to have, think about it now you see how many 40000 files 50000 files i had to read how much time i went to take notes from those days there was no photocopy in national archive by try to use to take notes or in your archive in <coughs> the office i had to write by pencil so today very few people i don't see many people doing and they produce so much of literature quickly yes which is not based on the facts my archives it is just uh, assumptions and or their hypotheses or whatever they want to say right. but it's not based on the real do- documents data right right and you professor uh, visited central asian countries several times ah oh, yes i did <laughs> what is your experience about no, that no i like it i feel like it at uh, these countries are like our second home because number one i come from kashmir so there is sort of affinity both in terms of cultural food and particularly and cultural there is a strong affinity and you know indians like uh, if you meet any indian and we central asia is many exotic places khara tashkent almaty anna wasana and other places so dushanbe i have been up to panj river also i have gone up to wakhan corridor end of the wakhan corridor <laughs> so that was beautiful and will you believe i the professor waldosh he is in the pamir university at karog mm-hmm. he was my local host and he said he told me to come i i come here come to the godia i said to her it was very difficult road mm-hmm. and we went to last village of wakhan corridor oh. on tajik side mm-hmm. it is mm-hmm. called langar Mm-hmm. So then the he met the then came Sarpanch Pan that lady held held women of that village and some other people who do photo then she pointed to me, look this is India just she look this is India so I first of all I just couldn't understand how India is here then I recollected oh it is it was Gilgit. Fourteen mm-hmm. miles or forty kilometers, just where I was standing. Gilgit. From there, it was Gilgit. Now you see the essence of British strategy was to deprive India of this frontier region, strategic region, which could have brought us closer to Central Asia. Direct. Right. It was just fourteen miles. gap we had to bridge had gilgit been with us we had to bridge 14 km gap and from gilgit to cross uh, wakhan and uh, reach pamir and reach central asia directly you can imagine china would have been no where in the game you right you see the great blunder and the and the great tragedy which the british did with us and in one file in one telegram the british home foreign secretary says to american americans were not first interested but then they had to follow suit all of the british uh, uh, advice and tell them we have to we have to close the artery to india 
that is we are not to let India to have control of this artery, that is this highway, this road, this road, kill me. Mm -hmm. So this, this was, they were determined to do it. And they did it. Hmm. So that was memorable that visit to Langar. I was in here at that time. I, honestly, I couldn't sleep. I thought he, they could what happened. It could have been, and we had we would have had Gilgit with them being with us. We would have no problems of communicating with Tajikistan and through Tajikistan with Kyrgyzstan, then Kazakhstan. Right. Yeah. Well, well, this division is also can Russian did the same thing, like in some places so Firgana you can see. Tajikistan is this side, yeah. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is this, and Uzbekistan, yeah. and then they have it. All these enclaves. Uh, enclaves, created enclaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that part, Kazakhstan and uh, Tatarstan, when the territories was, were deprived from Kazakh, uh, like former Kazakh kingdom. Mm -hmm. Also. But Tatarstan is now, uh, recently in Tashkent, there was President Academy of Sciences of Tatarstan. He was saying that Tatarstan Academy of Sciences is independent, it is not part of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Yeah. Well, his other academies are a part of Russian Academy of Sciences. Tatarstan is not. Right, but uh, you know what they can do? They are still inside of Russia. Ah, they, they are not bordering any no, other country. No, no, that is right. They are like inside. See how the politics are. This is the politics. No, that is, they are, they are, Neither Tatars they are nor Russians. Russians. They are Russians. But they are not Russians. Russian, they are us. <laughs> they are Russian passport, I mean. Yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. So we can see this kind of thing. I want to tell that now they are moving ahead towards uh, strengthening their identity, cultural and religious. Also. You believe in this? No, I could see that they are the Academy of Sciences, there was another director. So they were their program of activities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they were promoting this Tatar culture, Tatar activities, Tatar. And what are you saying? This Russian Ukrainian war? You see one one person here again in he said it is like what the British did to they created Pakistan to beat or bleed India. This is how the Americans created Ukraine to bleed Russia. It is like that. They will, they want to live, they will never lose, let them live. America is, but as I told you, I was recently in the US for two months, I could see that the prices of consumer items have risen. The it has become unaffordable everywhere in the world, and due to this war, right, right, due to this uh, Ukraine Russia war, but on the Biden or any other uh, administration in the US is bent upon hundreds billions of dollars to, and they say that somebody said that Zelensky is siphoning off much of aid to his own pockets. Yeah, it can, be, it can be true. But like um, there was a speculation that in case that Russia will uh, lose in this war, then Tatarstan and Chechnya will be first to leave. Do you believe in this or not? They will not lose. Russia will not lose. Because last in June this year I had been to Altai. Mm -hmm. So, to Russian Altai. Russian Altai. Because I just asked, no, because it is Gorna Altai. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I just asked, because we were hearing reports that lakhs of hundreds of thousands of Russians have been killed in this war. So I just asked for my curiosity local when we visited Altai village or something. How many people from this region have gone for to fight in the on the front? Uh -huh. 
they said uh, I am if so to how many have died or how many have come back so they said uh, one person had gone he was a which I was the sniper uh-huh. was the ace sniper uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> they said get he came back and didn't talk much about it Locally, he didn't talk. But then he was taken again. He went again. But then they said uh, no casualty. We didn't hear any casualty. Mm-hmm. And then somebody I crossed with other people. They said no. It is, there is a sort of lot of propaganda about it. That tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Russians have been killed on the front. In that region, I wherever I went. <laughs> I was particular about it, mm-hmm. so I didn't see anybody casualty or anything, and everything was going on normal. No, uh, huh? Budget of some educational institutions, if it was ten dollars, yeah, hundred dollars, it was down to seventy dollars like that. Mm-hmm. The budget was reduced to some extent, mm-hmm. but. Uh, Otherwise, I didn't see any people were conducting their uh, business and doing their work as usual. In Moscow, I don't know. It didn't look like. But in Moscow, I also didn't notice anything. I know. know. Well, mm-hmm. Everything is going as if, as if there is nothing. Mm-hmm. But prices must have risen. Yes. And the uh, ruble has devalued dollar. <coughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. How much? Uh, four hundred sixty probably. And it was two thirty or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Double. Yeah. yeah. So this is the result of this. Yes. Now Hungary is opposing this. That don't send money to aid to this and other countries. I it remains to see. To be seen how long they will stay it on. One hopes is there is an end to mutually acceptable. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So nice, <laughs> so nice to be with you and so nice to see you here.